Views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Last night I dreamed of dead people, my father and my mom. They met me at a strange hotel, they'd come to take me home. My suitcase was in disarray, my packing far from dawn. A cab driver sat patiently and let his meter run. Business left undone. I've checks to cash and debts to pay before I leave this town. My mother wailed, you foolish boy, your ledger's closed and driver sat patiently and let his meter run. Across the sky, a mighty wind did blow. Then all the dead that ever lived throughout eternity assembled all around there. Stirring the Cauldron. Now, here's... 
here's your host, Marla Brooks. Hey, Barry Meet everybody, and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron here on the Para-X Radio Network. Now, tonight's opening song, Last Night I Dreamed of Dead People, was written and performed by our guest tonight, Lon Milo Duquette, and it does tie into tonight's topic, which is the wiser guide of horror and the occult. Now, in addition to being a musician and recording artist, and we're going to be talking more about his music later in the show, Lon is a best-selling author, lecturer, occultist, and has written several successful books on Western mystical mystical traditions, uh, I tooth is in the way, um, including Freemasonry, Tarot, Kabbalah, Ceremonial Magic, the Enochian Magic of Dr. John Dee, and a lot of other things. But he's probably best known as an author who injects humor into the serious subjects of magic and the occult. And among his many books, also, he's the author of My Life with Spirits, Understanding Aleister Crowley's Toth Tarot, and The Tarot of Ceremonial Magic. So who could possibly be better to edit the wiser book of horror and the occult? And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So please join me in welcome, welcoming Lon Milo Duquette. Welcome, Lon. Thank you very much. How are you this evening? I'm good. And like I, I think I told you earlier, when I heard that song and some of your others, I just chuckled and um, loved them. And so, yes, you're doing a good job with music. Thank you very much. Mm. Now, you know, I, I got the book and I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to get. This is, you know, how, how the publishers will send stuff out, and you think, oh, yeah, that looks good, but right. you never know until you get it. And they, they say that um, advice to authors is that a book that captures a reader in the first sentence is the one that they will not be able to put down. Now, this book made me smile from the first page publisher's warning, which included <laughs> the requisite skull and crossbones, <laughs> And that in of itself got my attention, but then I went on to read your introduction, which was about your horror, your introduction into the horror genre, and your honeymoon with horror, which began appropriately enough with Edgar Allan Poe. So tell everybody a little bit about your summer with Poe. Well, I was a, a very depressed young young man of uh, uh, eight years old. <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> in Columbus, Nebraska, sort of a rural community, um, and I'd been uprooted from my paradisial home in, in Southern California and moved uh, roughly against my will to, to Nebraska. The family uh, got up and moved. My dad uh, uh, started the business in Nebraska, and uh, I was terribly, terribly depressed uh, because I really liked California and it was uh, in the, the mid-50s and uh, rock and roll was just starting and television was just getting going and, and uh, California was sort of the, where it was all happening and I, I had an older brother that uh, uh, made me totally aware of California was where it was happening. And where it was not happening was Columbus, Nebraska. It was <laughs> definitely not happening. And, uh, I mean, things like electricity and, and um, uh, especially out in the country, electricity and, and telephones and things like that are really new. And, and television, not everybody uh, had a television, and there was only a couple of signals that... Uh, that you could get, and it really was a trip back into the 19th century, mm-hmm. and, and uh, that just, you know, completely, completely freaked me, and there was a lot about Nebraska that, uh, uh, that freaked me. Um, with all due respects to Nebraskans and Nebraska, it's a scary place, um, um, because you go a little crazy out there in the prairie. It's, it's sort of uh, um, uh, it's very strange. And there were there were just tons of things that that, that uh, you know a child could be afraid of. Twenty four hours a day uh, in the spring and summer and fall, there were tornadoes. I mean, and torna- winds that killed people. Mm. Winds. Winds that drove pieces of wood 
through your skull and, and terrible stories like that. And, and um, every house had this, had a basement. And now in California, we don't have basements. You know? That's right, we don't. Okay. All of our houses don't have subconsciousnesses. Okay, <laughs> it's all out. All we let it all hang out in California. Yes, but it, we do. In, the, in Nebraska, even the houses have dungeons, and and uh, that's where you cower during tornadoes, and that's where you you go in the summertime to try to escape some of the sweltering heat, and. Um, and but what really got me was was the attitude of the the people, uh, the both the children and the adults that I would come in contact with. They they seemed to take genuine pride in their ignorance. Mm-hmm. And uh, and this, uh, these people will give you the shirt off of their backs. I, I'm not saying that they're not good, decent people. Mm-hmm. But but they take pride in being ignorant, and 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 not only that, there's there's this underlying darkness uh, because you can't be that you can't have a culture that's that repressed so much of the time without without every once in a while some of it bubbling out of the basement of their subconsciousness with, with uh, uh, just waiting, I say in the introduction, just waiting for the kiss of alcohol or lust or, or jealousy uh, to just burst out into murder and suicide and, and just terrible darkness. And, and it's something that a sensitive kid is aware of, and mm-hmm. I was aware of it, and it just plain freaked me out. <laughs> and one summer morning, I uh, both my parents were, and uh, I was alone in the house, and I was tried to watch television, and there, I couldn't pull in a signal at all, and so I, I did something absolutely unthinkable for a child of my age. I looked I looked around for something to read. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I I found uh, in my dad's collection of, of uh, he had a pretty good little collection of sort of Reader's Digest type uh, uh, literature, but but one was a collection of of uh, real literature and uh, including a volume of Edgar Allan Poe's uh, Tales of Mystery and Imagination, mm-hmm. and. Uh, it was just too adult for me, really. But the stories were short and unintimidating <laughs> in length. Mm-hmm. And I love the titles, the tale, Telltale Heart, The Pit and the Pendulum, you know, and, and yeah. Mask of the Red Death. I went, ooh, you don't get better than Mask of the Red Death. <laughs> and... Um, so I started reading, and I also got down the, uh, where I had to. I looked stuff up in the dictionary, and I looked stuff up in the encyclopedia. And it took me, you know, all day. It took me all day to, to finish a short story because I had to, every other sentence, I had to look stuff up. Mm-hmm. But when I, was through, when I was through reading it, and I finished the, the story, The Pit and the Pendulum, I realized that I was somebody else. Hmm. I realized that the experience, I mean, for an eight-year-old kid to, to realize this is, is pretty big. I mean, it was a spiritual experience of some kind. I realized that I had somehow mutated myself into a better person, a person I liked better, a person that could use the dictionary. Mm. A person that could use the encyclopedia, the, the, uh, a person that could get through Edgar Allan Poe, and and I liked the new me. And something else changed when I uh, when I uh, read it because for the first time in my life I was exposed to elegant language and great, great written 
art. Yes, yes. And, and Poe's characters, Poe's characters are, you know, they suck you in. You, you, you think, well, maybe they're just a little disturbed, but they're normal people like me. I can identify with that, you know. And then they pull you into a nightmare. They pull, uh-huh. they pull you in, and all of a sudden the, the protagonist, uh, narrative voice becomes my n- narrative voice, mm-hmm. and and that never happened to me. It was like taking a strange drug, and all of a sudden your whole brain works differently. And I realized that I had a narrative voice of my own. Wow! When I was through reading that one goofy little story on that hot summer day. All of a sudden, when I looked around at the world around me, I recognized the fact that I was looking around at the world around me. I was, I was, uh, I created the inner monologue of description. Mm-hmm. I was aware that I was aware. It, does that make any sense at all? Or am I just it as does. crazy as one of those Poe characters? No, I think we're all as crazy as Poe characters, but. No, it makes a great deal of sense, but what, what is really interesting to me is Poe wrote to scare people, basically, I mean, and tell good stories, and you were eight years old, and Poe gave you an epiphany. I mean, that that's rather amazing. I mean, for well, both you... you uh, yeah. Oh, I just showed you how scary Nebraska is. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I've got to tell you that there are a couple of people in the chat room from Nebraska. Um, one, I think, is somebody that you know, Pat, and then um, one Hi, of Pat. our Hi, Pat. one of a, one of our good friends, Mufi. And so they've been talking along with you about Nebraska for the last couple <laughs> of minutes. And 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 Mufi actually said, "Yes, they're proud of their ignorance." Uh, so. <laughs> Well, I'm sure they aren't, or they wouldn't be listening to your program. So, oh, I don't know. It, you know, maybe they're having a bad day or something. I don't know. No, well, Pat came for you. Moof, I can't explain, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. <laughs> She's a very good friend of ours. So, um, you know, okay. So here's the other thing. You started off your introduction by saying that horror takes its time. Now, you want to explain that. Yes, and now uh, now that I've terribly trashed Nebraska, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say something very good about Nebraska. Okay, okay. Something, uh-huh. something, okay. you know that the that the Indians called well, uh, Eastern Nebraska, where where I uh, uh, grew up, they called it the Happy Hunting Ground. And Lewis and Clark said it was it was paradise on earth. It was the most paradisial place that they've ever seen. And so, don't get me wrong. It's not. It's not breathtakingly beautiful. You know? Well, I'm just going. I'm going to interject for one second because I had to mute my mic because I was laughing out loud. But Mufi said uh, to tell you that you're welcome to visit her guest. Uh, I mean, her basement anytime. All <laughs> <laughs> that with a moi. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll get that number when you're through. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, in those days, uh, for me, mm-hmm. uh, a hot a hot summer afternoon in uh, Columbus, Nebraska, could have just as in 1950, what six or seven, mm-hmm. could have just as easily been 1857. Mm-hmm. There were no sounds of airplanes. There was lonely train whistles that going through to, to break the monotony. The silence of a hot summer day is so thick that you can actually hear the blood rushing through your 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 brain. You can actually hear the blood circulating in your head. Wow. And uh, the 
a lonely dog barking out in the, the, the distance or, or a crow or a bird or, if you're lucky, a beautiful meadow lark doing its, um, its beautiful little cry or a lonely dove. And in the summertime, the cicadas by the <laughs> millions do that incredible sound it's like the sound of, of um, frying bacon on uh, played through a loud speaker it's a mm. it's maddeningly beautiful uh-huh and there's no there's no touch of civilization mm-hmm. there's no there's no television or, or radio or, the, or you can arrange it to be this way anyway and uh, the, the the same unair conditioned um, air that's outside is inside the house and that, that our house had these gossamer white filmy curtains that would just billow billow in as if the house uh, itself were lungs or bellows that we breathe mm-hmm. in and out and in and out. And there's nothing to distract you from the words on that page. So the environment of Nebraska was absolutely perfect to enjoy great art, great literature, great entertainment, great enlightenment, Mm-hmm. that was actually created by and for a 19th century audience. Wow. Or in some of these cases, a 19th or early 20th century. Mm-hmm. And perhaps perhaps few places, um, certainly California couldn't have given me that. No. That, that, uh, that atmosphere. Uh, but, but Nebraska could, and it was just so natural and so normal. And it was almost like, uh, like just the absolute perfect setting for this uh, uh, experience. Mm-hmm. And and for that, I have to have to you know absolutely thank my lucky stars. I was so so lucky. And but you have to read it in such a way that you have to slow your heartbeat down. You have to get into the rhythm of of a nineteenth century mind, a mind uh, that at the very beginning of the industrial revolution, uh, uh, something that that a pace that wasn't altered or sped up or stimulated by fast cars or airplanes or the or the pace of of, um, of music even. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I, I I call my introduction horror takes its time, and you have to take your time too, uh, with with horror, or, or you're just going to miss out on a lot of fun. And uh, when they when they ask me to to um, uh, curate this uh, this book and then uh, introduce it. Um, I said, well, that's that's where I'm going to have to come from because <laughs> it's a it's it's a true spiritual occult experience to properly savor. It's an esoteric <laughs> it's an esoteric skill to actually mm-hmm. savor uh, true good classic horror, and um, the the book is is a collection of of. Um, some of the most recognizable names in in uh, horror, but also the the founding fathers of uh, of horror that lots of us haven't even have, haven't have never heard of. Exactly, and you know, I I was so thrilled when I opened the book and found that it was a compilation of horror stories by some of the best early, late 19th and early 20th century authors, like Bram Stoker, like Arthur Conan Doyle, like H.P. Lovecraft, um, and, and Alistair Crowley. I mean, the list goes on, and I thought, I've got a little gem here. 
You know, I mean, this is kind of like the perfect book to sit and just hold and read and embrace. And, and I opened it immediately to the Lovecraft story because you had written, and, and for those that are going to get the book, they'll find out, um, you wrote a little bio about each author at the beginning of the, their story. And you, you're like me. You kind of look for minutia. You kind of look for things that are a little bit different that, you know, you're not going to read in everybody else's bio. And so I went to the Lovecraft story, The Alchemist, first because you had written that he wrote this when he was 16 or 17, which is yes. very, very early. Very, um, very early in his career. Yeah. And when I started reading it, Immediately, I mean, the first paragraph took me back to that time that the story was supposedly written about. It took me right back there. I don't think it, it, I haven't gotten to all the stories, but this one in particular is probably the same for the rest of them. The minute you start reading these stories, they take you back. They take you um, back. They do. And, and, you know, I'm sitting here in the middle of L.A., and, you know, there are helicopters, there are sirens and stuff, yeah. but it immediately compelled me to block everything else out. And I think the whole book is going to do that. Um, so it was really, really kind of an interesting experience right then. But I was going to ask you, how would you compare this early writing um, of Lovecraft's, the Alchemist story, to some of his later works? Is there... Because I, I was reading Tolkien when all my friends were reading Lovecraft, so I kind of missed out. Um, yeah. Yeah, early on, early on, I missed out, too. Uh, well, first of all, The Alchemist uh, uh, is his story, and, and it's hard for us to uh, uh, forget that this is a 16-year-old H.P. Lovecraft that's doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, it it tells us more about uh, uh, Lovecraft, of course, than it does uh, <laughs> the protagonist in the in the story. And of course, he matures, and of course, he uh, uh, in in his later works and his in his longer works and the, the creation of that universe that that he would uh, eventually do. Mm -hmm. But it is it is such a treat. It is absolutely such a treat to see that in its rawest rawest form and mm -hmm. it, it, it's almost as much as anything pure Lovecraft mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, it, it's a treat and um, if people are are used to banquets of Lovecraft this is a this is an appetizer or a, or a delightful bonbon of of, uh, of Lovecraft and, and another guy, now Lovecraft, at the time he was writing this, this um, uh, when he was 16 and, and writing The Alchemist, he was inspired by this guy named Robert W. Chambers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and uh, now I didn't know about Chambers until just maybe uh, 10 or 12 years ago. And... Um, uh, somebody who had my email address emailed me and said um, that they were they were a filmmaker and they were filming The King in Yellow. Mm -hmm. And and they thought it would be fun to have occultists, uh, you know, contemporary occultists, uh, have uh, play cameo parts in it or appear in cameo parts. Mm-hmm. And he and he uh, uh, and he said, "Would would you be interested in that once we get the movie going?" And uh, and of course, I'd never heard of the King in Yellow. I'd never heard of, of Chambers. I'd never even heard of this guy. So what does a insecure person like myself do? I said, "Sure, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, movie, of course, I'll be in your movie." <laughs> and uh, well, obviously, nothing ever came to, uh, came of the movie like almost every uh, uh, movie project I've ever been involved in. Uh, uh, nevertheless, it got me looking up Robert Chambers, mm -hmm. and it got me reading The King in Yellow, and I discovered that that 
Chambers was like a proto Lovecraft. Mm. As a matter of fact, Lovecraft uh, uh, openly admired Chambers. Uh, when you read Chambers, you go, "Oh my God, this is Lovecraft thirty years earlier." Mm. And uh, King and Yellow is this uh, in, incredible uh, story about a book called The King and Yellow that everybody who reads it goes insane. That's and, the part I loved when I read that. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely loved that. It was yeah. deliciously horrific. Yes. And uh, so we've got Robert W. w. Chambers' uh, great little story called The Messenger. And... Uh, I found out that Robert W. Chambers, <clears throat> after he wrote these hair-raising, absolutely soul-terrifying uh, uh, pieces of art, then went on to uh, uh, write uh, continuation stories in ladies' magazines, and he was one of the most famous and highly paid <laughs> <laughs> author, authors of the 1880s and stuff. But... Mm. but it, it was Chambers that uh, started to create an alternate universe. Uh -huh. uh, he wrote about, uh, in like the 1880s, he was writing stories about the future. And in those days, the future was 1920. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in his imagination, he imagined what the, uh, 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 the United States as a, uh, uh, as almost a benevolent military dictatorship, uh, and, and that after the Civil War, things took a uh, took a different uh, uh, direction. And at mm -hmm. the time he was writing it, it could very well have actually done that. Yeah, yeah. And and then he 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 paints this alternate universe that is so close to the universe that we know projects it into a future which is now our past mm -hmm. and he obliges you to disconnect a whole bunch of stuff in your brain <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but you do he and he and he and he does it with such style and elegance and and uh, it is just so classy and you you read chambers and you go why didn't I ever know that I enjoyed something this elegant and this, this beautiful? I had no idea I could appreciate art, written art like this. And so mm -hmm. I'm really excited that we got Chambers in there. Well, yeah, and I was really excited. Again, small things keep me really happy. Um, when I was reading the biography you wrote on Edward Bulwer-Lytton, and for those who may not know, he was a poet and an author of novels and plays, but he also served as Secretary of State under Queen Victoria. Um, but, but all those are really good things, but the thing that tickled me most was that he's probably most famous for having penned the words, It was a dark and stormy night. That just knocked me out. I loved it. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Yeah, we have to thank him for that line. It was a dark and stormy night. I mean, who knew? You know, I mean, obviously, I guess, you know, we we probably figured that that came along much later, you know, or something. Because Snoopy, you know, Charles Schultz was really good about yes. Snoopy on his doghouse on the typewriter. It was a dark and stormy night. So I guess a lot of people figured that line came from Charles Schultz. But who knew? You know, Secretary of State right. under Victoria. That was that was rather amazing. Um, yeah, okay. Want... Term... Oh, go uh, ahead. No, coined the term what? Uh, the pen is mightier than the sword. That, really? That's a, that's a line from Bulwer Lytton. And um, the phrase, the pursuit of the almighty dollar, that came from Bulwer Lytton, too. Really? Wow. Yeah. And he was a good He's a good example of of the the connection between horror and the occult, because Bolwer Lytton actually was a bona fide, in your face, uh, initiate. Uh, I guess we could call him a, a Rosicrucian, uh, mm -hmm. and, and his his stories are are filled with 
not only esoteric uh, references, but in a way they're little initiation ceremonies in, uh, themselves. I mean, we, we're, we're reading a real adept when we're reading Bolar Lytton. Mm -hmm. Now, you allude to the fact that if someone hasn't read Aleister Crowley prior to the story included in this book, that they might be, um, th that he might be an acquired taste. Now, why is that, and why do you think that Crowley has always been perceived as larger than life? Uh, well, I think he wanted to be perceived like that ever since he was a kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and, when, and when you're that uh, invested in, uh, uh, in image, uh, it's probably going to eventually manifest. Mm -hmm. uh, he was he was very conscious of uh, of uh, image and uh, the the power of uh, the press, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, he he used he, he he used and considered um, uh, the newspapers of the day just to be an extension of his own writing mm -hmm. and his own and his own work. Uh, he was. Uh, as many people uh, know him to be, he, he is sort of the, the godfather of uh, uh, modern ceremonial magic, mm -hmm. and that's that's not uh, that's not stage magic where you make a rabbit peer out of a hat, <laughs> type, type. but uh, um, magic that uh, uh, uses the, the same. Uh, terminology and the same metaphors as uh, the ancient uh, magicians of, of uh, legend and uh, uh, actual magic. And, and most right. people, uh, especially that have uh, 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 been, been raised in a Christian environment, they would would probably. Uh, uh, in a way, accurately say, "Oh, you mean like black magic?" Well, mm -hmm. it's it's like what you think of as black magic because it's okay. not uh, uh, it's not a, a, a mainstream religion kind of spiritual art form. Mm -hmm. uh, but what it uh, what, when it's dealing with spirits and demons and archangels and angels and spirits and intelligences and things like that. Uh, uh, a, a true magician knows that that he, he or she's not dealing with uh, uh, objective uh, uh, spiritual entities, uh, but really metaphors of uh, of their own inner uh, inner workings. An angel could be the metaphors for for their uh, aspects of their their own higher consciousness and. and uh, Demons and spirits uh, uh, like that could be uh, metaphors for the the magician's own uh, uh, un uh, heretofore un untamed uh, vices and and uh, tendencies that are working against the magician, and so mm -hmm. getting a demon to work for you is, is exactly the same thing. As as turning your vices to good to productive creative purposes, um, mm -hmm. uh, so the when I learned to play the guitar, I use the example of that a lot. Uh, I I I used all of the the techniques of ceremonial magic. I I invoked a higher power, which is my parents, mm -hmm. to buy me to buy me a guitar. And I, I made an oath and a pledge that I would pay them back for with the money that I made playing the guitar. And a guitar manifested almost miraculously. You know, mm -hmm. there, <laughs> one moment there was a, there was no guitar in my room, and the next moment there was. And and <laughs> and, I, and I had done that through like prayer and and uh, mm -hmm. conjuration. I I appealed to mm -hmm. my my parents, but then I had to set to work. To, to conquer the demons of my own fingers and muscles. I had to conquer the demons of my, of my, uh, uh, of the sensitivity of my own ears just so I could tune the thing. 
I had mm-hmm. to conquer the, the demons of literally of every finger of both hands in order to play. And they were very, very uh, uh, reluctant to come under my control. Mm-hmm. <laughs> At first, yes. <laughs> At first, they were very, very reluctant because my muscles wanted to just do what they wanted to do and my fingers just wanted to do what they wanted to do. But I, through the power of my will, mm-hmm. one by one, I brought those skills, brought the, those demons that had been working against me all my life, I brought them under control until they were working for me. Now, that, you, you, that's just not um, an allegory for magic. That is magic. Yes, it is. That, that's what magic is. Mm-hmm. And, um, and Aleister Crowley uh, was probably, for his day, was probably the greatest mind living that got it. That <laughs> that actually, <laughs> that actually that actually saw the big picture of what this this can mean uh, to a person's uh, mental health, what it can mm-hmm. mean to their their uh, 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 their success in anything that they would they would turn their attention to, mm-hmm. and and so, but anybody who was superstitious or ignorant enough to be afraid of this terminology and to be afraid of such spiritual audacity Uh and independence, he was very happy letting them think that this is all black magic and go ahead and be afraid of me because you're too stupid to like me. (laughs) So, (laughs) So go ahead and be afraid of me. Because you're going to give me as much publicity as my my uh, my fans are, mm-hmm. and that's exactly. just how it seems to have worked. Yeah, it's like you don't have to actually curse somebody, but you can threaten them, and they'll curse themselves just by the words. There so you go. Yeah, it yeah. works really easy. Now, here in the 21st century, we're exposed to some very horrific things. I mean, both in real life and in fiction. I mean, gut wrenching, in your face, shocking things. Now, the stories in this book tend to mess with your mind. They tend to build suspense and keep you guessing till the end rather than being overtly obvious. Um, They kind of take you, they make you think as opposed to just seeing it in front of your face and, and, you know, turning your head because you can't stand to look at it kind of thing. So, in your opinion, how is horror different today than it was during the time that these stories were written? Well, you might say that uh, it's not horror that's different. Horror is, the, horror is the same. We can probably more accurately say what we're getting today isn't horror. Okay, yeah, true. And Horrific I, and horror are not necessarily the same thing. That's right. And, and I, uh, in my introduction, I sort of I compare it to the difference between a, a, a large, uh, leisurely... Uh, savory, gourmet uh, dinner and comparing it to the, the, the snack food shock of junk food uh, uh, terror, scares, mm-hmm. shocks, blood, guts. Um, every, every, what, two and a half seconds, the, the audience has to go, <laughs> you know, and... <laughs> And it's like junk food. It's like junk food compared to real, real spiritual nourishment. Yeah. And and so there's there's no no reason for it. And, and we become completely uh, jaded. And the next movie has to be more horrible and more bloody and more icky and everything else. And it, and just like food. Uh, we put this. We voluntarily put this stuff in our in our psyche, mm-hmm. and it's and it's truly. I don't want to sound like old grandpa and the old. Hey, oh, you don't. Man, that rock and roll will <laughs> take you into hell, you know. <laughs> uh, but but uh, it is. We are what we put inside ourselves. We 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 are nourished 
we grow, uh, we mutate ourselves, or, or we damage ourselves uh, mm -hmm. by what we put in uh, put in ourselves. And you know, a nonstop diet of of explosive blood and gore and guts and and um, torture and crying and screaming. That's not hard. That's th mm -hmm. that's just gr gratuitous. Um, stimulation mm -hmm. of a very unhealthy, uh, unhealthy uh, variety. Yes, because people become desensitized to that, yes. and they look at it as the norm rather than something that is not a good thing. So, yeah, well, is, that, is, is it any wonder in a in a highly armed society, you know, people shoot each other for cutting themselves? off on the freeway and mm -hmm. and um, you know cops are quick to shoot unarmed people and unarmed or and armed people are quick to shoot each other mm -hmm. and uh, uh, just because they see it how many every day you see about 40 murders on television sure I mean, and why? We, we take it as and 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 I how many people and I think I was guilty of this when um Lee Harvey Oswald was shot on camera. Right. Um, I don't think that my generation um, thought that it was as horrific, probably, as the older generation who had not been raised right. on guts and gore. You know, I mean, I looked at it and I thought, oh, wow, that's not good. But, but, but kind of in the same way that people look at a Western when somebody gets shot. Or, you know, something, it didn't have the same effect to me that it probably did to my parents or grandparents that were watching it. But and, that's, so, and that's really, that's really not horror. Uh, it, I guess you could call it an art form, and I, I have to, you know, tip my hat to the, to the skill of the, the movie makers, the, the, sure. the, the illusionary process. It's, uh, they're very talented uh, uh, hard-working people and they, they probably deserve you know the money a box office hit makes but you know that's not horror mm -hmm. horror is when you are completely identifying with a character mm -hmm. and then find yourself and that character buried alive mm -hmm. <laughs> and then for the next 40 minutes at least while you're reading, you're going, you're sharing every thought in the mind of a person that's in a coffin, in the ground, buried alive. That's, mm -hmm. that's horror. That reaches deep into your, your, as the Kabbalists would say, that reaches deep into your nepish. Okay? And and that uh, the same Kabbalist would say, and the nepish is where all of your demons are hidden, and you and they're going to stay there, and they're still going to cause all this trouble in your life, Mister Magician, unless you one by one find them and start putting them to work constructively for your life instead of destructively, mm -hmm. and. And whether you're, you're looking at terms, things in terms of psychology or magic or whatever, horror does it effortlessly. Good mm -hmm. horror takes you there effortlessly. And you do, you do have the opportunity to transform yourself. Horror, good classic horror, can be a self-transformational process. Well, all the stories in the book are are wonderfully horrifically <laughs> horrible. Um, I'm trying to think of all that, yeah. But it's a horrible it, book. Yeah. It's just a real horrible book. But how lucky. I mean, how lucky to have a book with 15 of the best stories of horror stories ever written. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. I, am, I mean, I was really almost doing cartwheels if I didn't think I'd, you know, fall down and break something. Um, I would have when I got the book because it, it really, really looked fantastic. And I just sat there and I, I just started reading um, immediately. And I, I think people need to 
get a good dose of horror. I mean, if they need to get a good dose of horror, get this book because, uh, as oh, I said, bed, it's a bed table book. <laughs> it is, and it took me right back. I mean, it was just like books I read growing up, and instead of you know something current or something you know whatever, um, it was really good. Now, um, I, I need to switch because the time is running out really fast. Um, we need to talk a little bit about your musical side because um, there is um, a competition that you're in. And, and let me let me go back a step and say that um, it's a well-known fact that you're a gifted songwriter and entertainer and that your music performance experience spans decades and includes touring with Arlo Guthrie. My God, how great. Um, Johnny Rivers opening for Sammy Davis Jr., and you've got something like 93 records out there. And so along that line, you have a record competition that you're involved in right now. And can you tell us quickly about that and how everybody can help? Oh, my gosh, yes. Um, well, last year I entered one of my songs into a, to a, a, a national songwriting contest, uh, and uh, the song won. And I was very pleased with that, and and uh, uh, so so uh, this year the the guitar center, you know, the the the, mm-hmm. the chain of big guitar stores all over the yep. the country, the guitar center um, is having a singer songwriter international competition, and um, uh, they uh, they base it on uh, you, you can. Uh, uh, enter five of your music videos. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I, I entered five of my uh, videos that are on YouTube, and uh, I I do have a lot of Facebook friends. I've got a you know five thousand Facebook friends and six thousand Facebook fans and stuff just for my books and and just because I'm a crazy guy, and um, <laughs> um, I. I put those up, put those songs up, uh, and I entered the contest kind of late. And so I told everybody in my my Facebook thing, "Gee, listen to these, because every time you play them, every time you play them, uh, it counts as another vote." And uh, there are eleven thousand uh, entrants. There's eleven thousand songwriters currently. And the contest goes till November seventh. Currently, I'm number two. Wow! 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 And wow! If everybody would uh, please, uh, when you get a chance, if you would like to at least hear the things, and by hearing, you're automatically voting. Uh, just Google Guitar Center Songwriting Contest. And, and it'll take you right there. There's a big long URL, but if you just Google Guitar Center Singer Songwriter Contest, or just Songwriting Contest, you'll go instantly there. And I'll be on the front. I'll be on the front page. My my smiling or my unsmiling face, uh, a picture of me in London someplace, um, is uh, there. And just click on it and please have a listen and. Um, you can do it more than once a day, but please don't open up 50,000 tabs and do it 50,000 times a day because they'll accuse me of trying to stuff the ballot box. So. God forbid. But yes, but you can vote often. <laughs> you can, <laughs> vote, you can vote often if you vote, if you, uh, vote uh, wisely. And, and, uh, and when you're, yeah, do it uh, when you're actually listening to them. So, you know, uh, I want to... If I if I do well in it, I want to do it fair and square. And so, yeah. Well, I, I I did it, and and also people can go and to your fan page, and there's also I think a link there as well. Oh yeah. But they should yes. also go and like your fan page as well. Yes. And um, so we, I mean you're all over the place. Where can people get a hold of you? I mean, what's your what's your um, website? Yeah, yeah. The, the easy, the, there's um, uh, lawn uh, dot com. Of course, you can just go to go to that. Um, but if if they're on Facebook, Facebook is is really my face to the world. 
Uh, I've got a Facebook uh, uh, fan page and a Facebook uh, friend page. And, uh, and believe it or not, if everybody's got a pencil and a piece of paper, I'm going to give you my, my email address because mm-hmm. I've, I've long ago given up the idea of privacy. <laughs> uh, so my email address is simply Lon Milo, and treat it as one word, Lon Milo at Gmail. Lon Milo at gmail.com. And, and I try to answer uh, my, my email. I travel around a lot, so there's, um, uh, in my, I've never been this busy in my life. I'm 66 years old. I guess I was retired the first 60 years of my life. <laughs> and now you're catching up. That's good. Now I'm, now I'm catching up. I'm very, <laughs> very, I travel around a lot. And, uh, um, and now I usually go to another city and I speak. Uh, in the daytime and at nighttime, I I sing, and I've been very very lucky in getting some very very uh, good venues uh, in the cities that I visit. So, well, that I'm is fantastic, guy. and I'm gonna yeah, you are a lucky guy, and I'm gonna have you come back at some point to talk a little bit more about horror and stuff because um, I just think it needs to be talked about, right? So if it you don't mind. Does. We'll grab you back, and we'll play a couple of songs, and we'll talk about horror. And I want to thank you for joining me tonight. It was it was a great show. It was a fun show. Um, yeah, I want more. Okay. <laughs> I'm not greedy. I want more. Uh, okay. And if you ever want to talk about tarot, that's another one of my passions, you know. So. Good, good. So you're, we can talk about a whole bunch of different things a whole bunch of different times. That works okay. for me. All right. All right, well, keep us posted on the competition, and um, until next time, everybody, blessed be, and merry meet again. Good night. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Martha Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron staring. Any rebroadcast or use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2013. Moonlight Hall by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com. <laughs>